the Holy Temple. All right. 2 Corinthians 10.2 is where we're going to start. It goes like this. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold. This is Paul. I beg that I don't have to be bold when I get there. Like he's already telling them, don't think I'm coming with cookies and cream. Right? But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some. Uh-oh. Someone's in trouble. I intend to be bold against some who think of us, look at this, as if we walked according to the flesh. Oh, you got it wrong. Right? That's a, that's a great intro. Now watch where it goes. The very next verse, 2 Corinthians 10.3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Right? 2 Corinthians 10 4. We're just going to go down Corinthians here. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. How many times have I told you guys about strongholds? Strongholds are those addictions, are those barriers that are holding you back from the fullness. It's a wall that's been put up. We need to rip those strongholds down, right? But those strongholds are where? It's, it's, it's in the mind. The battle is in, in the mind, right? So for the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Second Corinthians 10, 5. If you need me to click these, I will. Uh, but this was just easier and quicker. Um, casting down arguments and every high thing that, is, that exalts itself against the what? Knowledge. Where's knowledge at? Here, against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Where's the war? The war is in your head. You need to bring every thought into captivity into being obedient to Christ. This is spiritual war. Uh, and so let's go down here to Romans 7.23 and we'll get a little bit more of that. But I see another law at work in my body, warring against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells within me romans 7 25 thanks be to god through jesus christ our lord so then i myself serve the law of god with my mind where's the battle at with my mind but with my flesh i serve the law of sin we are the kingdom and god lives within you and that is your weapon our weapons aren't carnal but the battle's in your mind. So what's your weapon? God, who is living in the kingdom, the king of the kingdom, right? We have some scripture on that. Luke 17, 20. Now, when he asked the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Luke 17, 21. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, what? I mean, I don't even got to read it, right? Do I got to read it? For the kingdom of God is within you. It don't come by, look at this, there's the castle. So if you're the kingdom of God, and as we've already stated, then you're the temple. And you're the temple of God, right? Well, here we go. I'm going to read this real quick, okay? Um, I'm going to, yeah, I'll read the whole thing. Etymologists don't entirely agree on the meaning of the word temple. Oh, is there a temple in anatomy? Where's your temple in the anatomy? Oh, on your head? So on your mind. So that's the temple of God, right? Is this your temple? Uh-oh, uh-oh, things clicking yet? Is this the temple of God? That's the temple, right? Oh, and what does the temple bring together? Sound and sight. Are we looking with the right eyes and the right ears? Do we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear? Uh, let's see what, what God has to say about the temple here. And this gets real important. First Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.17. Very important. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Uh, but sometimes the temple gets loaded with junk, right? We're in the world, the temple's loaded with junk, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 6.19. Do you not know that your body is... I mean, it'll pretty much just repeat itself. You know what I mean? It can just... Re because it nails it in. I don't know how anyone can go, I just, I didn't get it. He just, just nails it in. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own? And this is very important. 1 Corinthians 6.20. 
You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This ain't for the couch guy. This is for the guy that acknowledges everything that Jesus went through, knows that he paid that ransom. That's what it is. He paid a ransom for you. All right. Romans 12, 2, and we're going to hit some heavy ones. Hopefully that these verses, I don't even need to preach, right? Hopefully the verses preach for themselves. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your what? Was oh, that the topic of tonight? The mind? Imagine that. Imagine, is that the war? That's the war. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal. Not who you can go transform. You can't change anyone's mind if you haven't fixed yourself. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern. We talked about discernment today, did we not? By testing, you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. You don't need a tablet. No one handed you a Mosaic law. You don't need a tablet. You have the Holy Spirit. You can spiritually discern what is good and 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 what? What is good and perfect. Ooh, law didn't even pull that off. Law didn't make anything perfect. But now you have the Holy Spirit and you can discern what's perfect. Oh, James 4.4. 4. You adulterous people. Why adulterous? You're an adulterer if you think you're going to love God and love the world. That's adultery. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 1 John 25, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't get caught up in the moment. Stay focused. The relationship is what matters. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. Paul, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with sexual immoral people of the world. Whoa, this is a completely different doctrine I'm reading tonight. What? Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. Are you hearing Paul? He's not telling you to stay away from the world like you're thinking he's telling you. He's telling you don't participate in the world and don't love the world. But he's not telling you to not associate to the world. Uh, God is not calling, call, and I even said this earlier, God is not calling followers to go hide into a cave and run away from the world, but rather to confront the world and endure to the end. First Corinthians 5.11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an adulterer or a reveler or a drunkard or an extortioner not even to eat with such a person. So who are you supposed to be hanging out with and who are you supposed to not be hanging out with? Ooh, maybe we misunderstood the way this Bible speaks. He's talking about the, I know there's a few of you that I plan on being bold with. What do you think he was saying? There's a few of you I plan on being bold with. That's what he's talking about. He ain't talking about the non-believer. He's talking about the one who claims to be a believer but still walks in sin. First Corinthians 5.12, this is a continuation from 5.11 here. Uh, for what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? So judgment is on the inside of each and every person that is a child of God. Why? Because each and every person make up the body of Christ. So yes, the battle is within. The battle is here because we're fighting against sin in our mind. That's a very harsh battle, right? Romans 12, 5. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. I mean, there it is. I just, everything I just told you, he says in like five words. All right. So what should be in the temple? Oh, and we've already discussed it, but I've had, I have it here, right? If, if the world has no place in the temple, then what should be in the temple? Well, instead, let us fill the temple with prayer, right? The, the temple should be filled with prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. It means everything. If you're always in prayer, you have no time. Philippians 4.6, do not be anxious, worry, right, about anything. We know this verse. 
but in everything, so what does that mean? Pray about everything and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Well, we haven't we thought about this. Pray about a few things. Pray about what really concerns me. Pray when I am really have a heartache. No, pray about everything. Pray about nothing. Pray about everything. This isn't hard to understand here, right? And supplication and, and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So when you worry about nothing and you walk in the spirit and you pray about everything, God's gonna answer. Oh, it's, it's fact. God's gonna answer. And then your next move is to give thanks to him for what he did. That verse is clear, right? You can't get around that verse. It isn't worry sometimes, worry once in a while. And it isn't pray sometimes, pray once in a while. It's clear, right? So the temple should be filled with prayer, not worldly things. We're going down this list of what you should have in your temple, right? Temple should be pr filled with prayer. What else belongs to the temple? Humility. Right? We know this. Like I said, some of these things you're going to know, but we're going to hammer them. Humility belongs in the temple of God. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor. We know this one, right? In spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what's that mean? So if you're the kingdom of heaven, those that are poor in the spirit is the kingdom of heaven. There's that. Proverbs. We'll let Sophia tell you. Sophia, right? A man's pride. And it is a wisdom teaching. You can even tell by the way it's written. Proverbs 21, 29, 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Well, if that ain't a wisdom teaching, I don't know what is, right? A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. First Peter 5.5, 5. likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, but watch this, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, if you sell everything you have and you follow him, but then you give everything you had to the poor, is your ministry over? You haven't have anything else to sell. You don't have anything else to give. You can't help anyone that's poor. You can't provide for your family if you're poor. So is that what he means? Does he mean literally make it to where nobody in your household can live? I want you to sell everything you have and just hope for the best. It's not what he's saying, and I think we're gonna prove it right now. Uh, he's not saying that you shouldn't work. In fact, the temple of God should be a place of good works. Acts 18.3, and because he was the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. Okay, this is Paul. If you were, I didn't put only because I didn't feel like we needed to go through all the scripture. If you read the next two verses before this, and I'll tell you what it is, right? Uh, Paul leaves Athens, goes to Corinth, uh, the next verse. Uh, when he goes to Corinth, he meets up with some Jews he had met at another time and these Jews were tent makers. He then decides to stay with those Jews. Now we're at this verse. And because he was the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. So Paul was a tent maker. He worked. He still had a job. He still, he didn't just sell everything he had, gave up on work and hoped for the best. No, he was a tent maker. That was his trade. First Corinthians 4, 12. We work hard with our hands, but this is very important. When we are vilified, we bless. Is the battle in your mind, right? Uh, when we are persecuted, we, we, we endure it. 1 Timothy 5.8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, oh, so you're supposed to be provided, so you are supposed to be working. We're not supposed to just live like hermits, right? But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, oh, look at this. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily, do a good job, right? As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord, in case you didn't know what Lord. You are serving the Lord Christ, in case you weren't there, right? If you're going to work every day miserable, you're not going to work for the right reasons. Now, the entire reason that I showed you this, because and I brought it up to you guys in the past, but in, in passing, but uh, you know, it, it, the, the argument is if Yahweh is not his dad, why is he in his father's house, which is the temple, right? Let me show you. We're gonna look at all the accounts. We're not gonna look at one, we're gonna look at every account that is the same story, right? We're gonna start in Matthew's account. Matthew 21, 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Matthew 21, 13. And he said to them, it is written, 
My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. He does the action in the world, but the action tells a different story. But you're not reading in the spirit, so you're only reading this, the action. Jesus went to the temple, he took a whip, he just... But you're not reading what's actually taking place. Why did he have the whip? Well, first of all, the whips, you, did you hear a whip? I just read Matthew's account. I didn't see a whip. Where's the whip at? That's Matthew's account. Let's go to Mark. Mark 11, 15. So they, so they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Mark 11, 17. Then he, taught, then he taught saying to them, is it not written? We're going to cover where he's talking about too. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you, but you have made it a den of thieves. So Mark matches Matthew. Mark being the oldest gospel, I don't know if you guys know that, but Mark is supposed to be the oldest gospel written. Uh, and so, and John is supposed to be the latest gospel written. It was the, it was the, the, so Mark being one of the, probably the first is most assumed, John being probably one of the last of the gospels being made. But when you get to John, things get a little different. And I think you're gonna see that. So let's go a little bit further here. Luke's account. This is where it starts getting a little wonky. 1945. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it. 1946. Saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Uh, Luke 22. And this is so the Pharisees approach him. You didn't see this in the other, but watch this. The Pharisees approach him. Watch this. Luke 22. Tell us, they said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Luke 23. But he answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing and answer me. Luke 24. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves. The Pharisees are going back and forth like, oh crap, what do we say? Because this could go bad no matter which route we take. So watch what they do here. And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from. You ready for the kicker? Watch Jesus. Luke 28, and Jesus said to them, neither am I telling you by what authority I do these things. They don't know his father and they've rejected Christ, right? What does the Bible say? Then said John 8, 19. Then said they unto him, where is thy father? Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. So it goes deeper. Watch how John's changes a little. John 2, 14. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. John 2, 15. And making a whip of cords. You didn't hear a whip in any of the other gospels. Did you hear it at John's? John's a little bit more mystical. And I'm gonna explain. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. John 2, 16. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of what? Is that what the other verses said? It's not what the other verses said, is it? What the other verses say? Mm. All of a sudden, now it's merchandise. There is a difference between a den of thieves and selling merchandise. <laughs> I mean, there is. You could try to pair them together, but you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to pair it together because it ain't there, right? There's merchandise, and then there's a, a room full of thieves. <laughs> there is a difference, no doubt, right? But John's taking it deeper. Is this literal? Did, did you just see what we just covered this entire time? What should be in his house? A house of prayer. Right? Worldly stuff don't belong in this house. Where's God live? In the temple. What, what temple's getting cleaned out? John 2, 18. On account of this, the Jews demanded, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to these things? John 2, 19, just in case you're not sure. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Oh, they're, they're like, wait a minute, hold up. John 2, 20. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're gonna raise it up in three days? John 2, 21. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Ooh. This is in the same conversation as him going into the middle of the temple. Do you think that's a coincidence? That he's applying a teaching about the temple that will resurrect in three days? 
where he's applying a teaching that, that those who accept Christ, God goes in you, cleans out the temple. We don't live in the world of merchandise. We've sold everything we have. And as it is written, my house will be a house of what? Pray without ceasing. This is all about you. It isn't about a temple that he went into and started whipping people. This is another mystical teaching that he did do. I believe he did it. You'll notice he didn't hit anybody. It doesn't say that he whipped anybody, right? He taught. He went in and he performed an act, just like the Old Testament, and then you're to read it in the spirit on what the act is. Are we walking in the spirit? God is spirit. We must worship him in the spirit. If all you see is a man walking in the temple and start whipping people because he's angry, then you're not understanding that scripture at all. Leviticus 114. And if the burnt sacrifice of his offering to the Lord is a bird's, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. What were they selling in the temple? And what did he kick out? All right, let's look at Isaiah 56, 7, because here's where he quotes it. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted. The same things he kicked out. This is Yahweh, right? Shall be accepted upon my altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer. So what do we do when we read the Old Testament? We see the worldly, and now we apply it spiritually. Get your worldly thoughts of what you think gives you repentance. Get your worldly merchandise, what you think is building up riches, right? He went into the temple, you, and cleaned house. And then he combines it with this verse, Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to fall, uh, and to go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name and say, we are delivered so we can continue with all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I have seen it, says Yahweh. Oh, by the way, why did John use a whip? That's because John's text is a little bit more mystical. He, he, you see what I mean? The, the earlier teachings, they didn't quite grasp it. They hadn't gotten to the, the deeper meaning yet. So you get to Mark, and it's like, oh, that of these. But then you get to John, it's merchandise. Do away with the merchandise of the world, right? And it brought in a whip, right? Why? Because Jesus was whipped for all of those things. That's all sin. He was whipped for your sins. So it brings in a whip. It's a, it's a teaching when you're reading it in the spirit, right? Did Jesus take on the sin of the world? Was he whipped?